In this short video, we're going to look at evaluating triple integrals using cylindrical coordinates. So cylindrical coordinates, so rather than having an x, y, and z, we're going to have three coordinates, but they're going to be r, theta, and z. So z doesn't change. It's the same as we have with rectangular coordinates or Cartesian coordinates. And the r and the theta are the same as the polar coordinates for x and y. So that would tell us that we have the same relation for x and y. x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta, x squared plus y squared equals r squared, and z doesn't change. So let's practice these. We'd like to plot the following cylindrical coordinates and change them to rectangular coordinates. So our first one, our first point is 2 comma pi over 6 comma 1. So that's my r, theta, and z. So we start by go ahead and uh, drawing a line segment with length 2, and which makes an angle of pi over 6 with the positive x-axis. And then we're just going to go straight up from the end of that line segment, one unit. And that gives us a that gives us the point 2 comma pi over 6 comma 1. Now to convert this to rectangular coordinates, I'm just going to use x equals r cosine theta. r is 2, cosine of uh, pi over 6 is root 3 over 2, so that product is root 3. For y, we'll just use r sine theta. Sine of pi over 6 is a half twice times a half equals 1. And we already have z equals 1. So in rectangular coordinates, the point is going to be radical 3, comma 1, comma 1. Our second point has cylindrical coordinates, 3, comma 3 pi over 2, comma negative 1. So again, I'll start with the line segment at the origin of length 3, making an angle of 3 pi over 2 with the positive x-axis. So that's going to be a line segment then on the negative y-axis. And then we just need to go down one unit, and that'll give us the point with cylindrical coordinates 3 comma 3 pi over 2 comma negative 1. Now, it's actually pretty clear what the rectangular coordinates are without having to resort to the formulas. Uh, by looking at this, we can see that x equals 0, y is going to be negative 3, and z, of course, is negative 1. But just to be sure, let's go ahead and put them into the formula. Sure enough, cosine of 3 pi over 2 is 0, so x equals 0. Sine of 3, I, of 3 pi over 2 is negative 1, so that'll give us negative 3 for the y coordinate, and z of course is negative 1. So the rectangular coordinates of that point are 0, comma 3, comma negative 1. So let's look at these coordinate surfaces. Coordinate surfaces means you just take one of the coordinates and set it equal to a constant. And what do they look like? So our first one, we're going to set theta equal to a constant. Theta equals pi over 3. What surface would that be? Well, to clarify, theta is fixed at pi over 3, but r can vary from negative infinity to positive infinity, and z can vary from negative infinity and positive infinity. So what we're going to get then is a plane. Its angle with the positive x-axis has to be pi over 3, but it continues up and down. So in the z direction, 
and then forward and back in the R direction, have you. And um, that will give us that plane. It's going to cross through the z-axis. It's going to make an angle of pi over 3 with the positive x-axis. In part b, we're looking at the surface r equals 3. So that is the set of points where the radius, so the distance from the z-axis is 3, and then z can vary, and then, then the uh, angle theta can vary as well. So if I go back to uh, rectangular coordinates for this formula, this gives me x squared plus y squared equals 9. Sure enough, that's just a cylinder with radius 3 centered on the z-axis. Our last example is not one of the, the unit coordinates because we know what z equals a constant is. z equals constant is going to be a plane which is parallel to the xy plane. So here's something a little bit different. Here I have r equals 3 sine theta. If this were polar coordinates, I would say that this is a circle. But we will analyze it the same way we would with polar coordinates. I have multiply both sides by r, and now I can convert r squared to x squared plus y squared. r sine theta is y, so that will equal 3y. I'll go ahead and make that equal to 0, so I can complete the square. So half of 3 is 3 halves. If I square that, I'll get 9 fourths. Add that to both sides. And after factoring, I get x squared plus, in parentheses, y minus 3 halves squared equals 3 halves squared. So this is going to be another cylinder, but the center of the cylinder is not going to be at the origin, or the axis of the cylinder is not going to be the z-axis. It's going to be offset. It's going to pass through where y equals 3 halves. So this is a cylinder. The axis is parallel to the z-axis, passes through the point 0, comma, 3 halves, comma, 0. That's where y equals 3 halves. And its radius is also 3 halves. So we have this cylinder, which is offset from the z-axis. Its axis it passes through the y-axis at y equals 3 halves. So how would we evaluate a triple integral using cylindrical coordinates? Well, if I have a solid, and I can express the top and bottom surfaces as functions of r and theta, so in other words, z is bounded above by a function of r and theta, and bounded below by a function of r and theta, and that's going to be true for all r and theta in this domain d, which is going to be the projection of e onto the xy plane. And if d can be bounded, so the region d can be bounded by two functions which depend on theta, and theta is bounded by two constants, alpha and beta, then I can write, in the most general case, the triple integral over the solid E of f dv is going to be the iterated integral. The outermost integral is theta because it has constant bounds. Then the middle integral is taken with respect to r, which is going to be bounded above by h2 of theta and bounded below by h1 of theta. So let me go ahead and put some parentheses here. And then the innermost is the z integral. And so its limits are going to be the equations of the top and bottom surfaces.
course, I'll have to convert my integrand to polar coordinates. And since I, I'm really using, uh, I say polar coordinates, cylindrical coordinates, and since I'm using polar coordinates, I have to have the r dr d theta. But since I still have the dz, I bring the r out in front of the dz. So I still have this extra r in my integrand. All right. So here we're given a triple integral in cylindrical coordinates. And we're just asked to sketch the solid. So, you know, let's look at this. Um, you know, the integrand is one because this triple integral represents a, a volume. We have the r dz d theta dr. That's just my dv. And so uh, I have z as my innermost. So z is going between zero and r. Theta goes between zero and two pi and r goes between zero and two. Now you may be wondering, why is it that I have d theta dr instead of dr d theta? And it doesn't matter because both of those have, integrals have constant upper and lower bounds. So the order in which they're evaluated will not matter. But I do have to do dz first because its bounds are functions of r uh, and theta. So let's think about this. So we're saying that z it goes between 0 and r. Get that from the bounds on the integral there. Well, r is radical x squared plus y squared. And z equals radical x squared plus y squared. That's the equation of a cone. So I am less than that means I must be below that cone. This solid must be below that cone. I'm going from uh, all the way around the z-axis. That's what zero theta going from zero to two pi tells me. And then the fact that uh, r goes out to 2 means that uh, I'm going to be under this cone, but only out until r is equal to 2. So the region here is the region that's beneath the cone out to where r equals 2. Well, r equals 2, remember, is a cylinder. So we could say that it is the portion which is underneath the cone, above the xy plane, and inside the cylinder r equals 2. So I think that's what we wrote here. It's the region below the cone, above the disk, x squared plus y squared less than or equal to 2 in the xy plane. The other way we can think of that is we're looking at the interior of the uh, cylinder, x squared plus y squared, equals 2 between 0 and 2 for the z values. And then we're just going to remove the interior of this cone. All right, let's actually work out a triple integral here. So we can see that the integrand is going to be something very simple when we change it to cylindrical coordinates. And the solid, our domain of integration, is the region that's inside a cylinder and between two planes. So it's just going to be uh, something very simple. It's going to give me constant bounds uh, when I convert this to cylindrical coordinates or write it in cylindrical coordinates. So z goes between negative 5 and 4. R goes between 0 and 4. And how did I get that? Because the cylinder x squared plus y squared equals 16 tells me that r squared equals 16. So r has to be 4. And so we're inside that cylinder. So we're going from 0 to 4. And then we're going all the way around the cylinder. So theta has to go from 0 to 2 pi. And what about the integrand? 
Well, radical x squared plus y squared is just r. So the triple integral, the iterated integral in cylindrical coordinates, well, all of the bounds are constants. So I could actually write this in any order, but I go ahead and put z on the inside. So my bounds go from negative five to four. R goes from zero to four in the middle and theta goes from zero to pi on the outside. Um, I have R, which is what my integrand is in cylindrical coordinates. And then dV, remember, is R, dz, dr, d theta. So r times r gives me r squared, but that's a constant with respect to z. So the antiderivative would just be r squared z. That gets evaluated between 4 and negative 5. That'll just give me 9r squared dr d theta. So let's go ahead and take the antiderivative there. I would get uh, the antiderivative of r squared is 1 third r cubed. So I get 3r cubed evaluated between 4 and 0. 4 cubed is 64, and 3 times 64 is 192. So I'm left with 0 to 2 pi of 192 d theta, and that's just a constant. So I'll just multiply it times b minus a. So that would be multiplied by 2 pi. So I get 384 pi. So let's look at a little bit more involved problem. We're going to find the volume of the solid remaining when the cylinder r equals 3 sine theta is removed from this sphere, which is centered at the origin with a radius of 3. Now, we've seen this equation before, r equals 3 sine theta. That was back in example 2. Let's just take a look at what that was. Back in example 2, r equals 3 sine theta. We said that's a cylinder. Its axis is parallel to the z-axis. It passes through 0, comma 3 halves, comma 0. Um, so a point on the y-axis. Its radius is 3 halves. So what we have here is a sphere of radius 3. And then we're going to imagine this cylinder drilling out a hole in that sphere. We'd like to know what the volume of the sphere remains. Uh, well, I think the simplest way to go about this is we will find the volume that we're cutting away. So the volume that is both inside the sphere and inside the cylinder. And then we'll just subtract that uh, from the volume of the sphere, which we'll just calculate using the formula we know from geometry. Now we're also going to take advantage of symmetry. There's quite a, this object, the solid that gets cut out from the sphere, um, well, the top and the bottom, so the portion above the xy plane is the same as the portion um, below the xy plane. And then if I just look at the top, the portion that's in front of the yz plane has the same volume as the portion behind the yz plane. So looking at this from the top now in the xy plane, this is the circle r equals 3 sine theta. So what we're going to do is just use this portion, this half disk, which is in the first quadrant. We're going to find the volume of this solid, which is above that half disk. If I multiply it by 2, I'd get the volume of the solid above the xy plane. And if I multiply it by 4, then I will get the whole volume of the solid removed from the sphere. Now, there might be some question as to why I would uh, choose to use the half disk rather than the whole disk. 
I'm going to give you a detailed explanation for it. But as a general rule, anytime you can keep everything in the first quadrant, where both x and y are positive, or in our case, sine theta and cosine theta are both positive, we are going to avoid some pitfalls. We're going to avoid some gotchas where we could make uh, some mistakes that will lead to the incorrect answer. So let's see if we can set up this integral. Let's look at the bounds on z. Well, I'm going to have, um, I said I'm only going to look above the xy plane. So the lower bound is going to be z equals 0. The upper bound is going to be the surface of the sphere. So let me go ahead and solve my equation for z. I'll use the positive square root because I'm looking at where is the portion of the sphere where z is positive. So these are my bounds on z. Of course, I don't want to leave this in uh, rectangular coordinates. I want to change it to cylindrical coordinates, which is pretty simple because uh, x squared plus y squared is r squared. So my bounds on z are 0 for the lower bound and radical 9 minus r squared for the upper bound. All right. What about r? Well, I'm going to look at my projection here onto the xy plane. And my r value in this half disk starts at 0 and then goes out to the edge of the circle where it's r, uh, three, r equals 3 sine theta. And then what about theta? Well, remember we have to be careful with these circles that are not centered at the origin. Um, if I just think about the equation here, certainly when theta is 0, I'm down here at the origin. But then as theta increases, sine of theta increases, until at theta equals pi over 2, sine of pi over 2 is 1, so my radius is 3. So going from 0 to pi over 2 takes me halfway around the circle. So that will get me the whole uh, half of the disk that I'm using. So theta goes between 0 and pi over 2. So now I've got all the bounds of my integral. So I can go ahead and write that out. So the volume of this portion of the top uh, is going to be from 0. I'll have 0 to pi over 2, then 0 to 3 sine theta, 0 to radical 9 minus r squared. 1 is my integrand because it's volume. And then dv is r, dz, dr, d theta. So let's see if we can evaluate this integral. So here's my integral again. Anti-differentiate with respect to z. And then I'm going to evaluate that between z equals 0 and z equals radical 9 minus r squared. So now, in order to evaluate my next integral, the dr integral, I'll need to make a u substitution. I'm going to be pretty careful about this because my bounds are functions of theta. At least my upper bound is a function of theta. So as usual, I'd have u equals 9 minus r squared. So du equals minus 2r dr. The lower bound is pretty easy to convert because it's a constant. So when r equals 0, u will equal 9. And then for the upper bound, uh, when r equals 3 sine theta, u would equal 9 minus 9 sine squared theta. So I just took 3 sine theta and squared it. I can factor out the 9 there. What's left over is 1 minus sine squared theta, which would be cosine squared theta. So my upper bound is going to be 9 cosine squared theta. So now my integral in terms of u, I'll have the negative 1 half. That comes from the negative 2r dr here. My lower bound is 9. Upper bound is 9 cosine squared theta. Integrand now is u to the 1 half. 
So the antiderivative would be u to the 3 halves. I need to multiply that times 2 thirds, but I already have the negative 1 half. So now I get negative 1 third. And I'm going to evaluate that between 9 and 9 cosine squared theta. So 3 halves power means take the square root and then cube it. So uh, square root of 9 is 3, and that cubed will give me 27. And I'll also have cosine cubed theta. We'll talk about this in a minute. And then, obviously, just minus 27. So I can factor out the 27, multiply that times the negative 1 third. That'll give me a negative 9. And I'm left with cosine cubed minus 1 in the integrand. So cosine cubed, I think of as being cosine times cosine squared. Cosine squared is 1 minus sine squared theta. This is a technique we learned in Calc 2. And so I'll distribute the cosine theta inside the parentheses. That'll give me two fairly simple integrals. Antiderivative of cosine theta is just sine theta. Antiderivative, antiderivative of 1 is just theta. And then for cosine theta, sine squared theta, I make a u substitution. u would equal sine theta du is cosine theta, d theta. So my antiderivative is going to be sine theta uh, minus one-third sine cubed theta after my u substitution, and then minus theta. I'll evaluate that between 0 and pi over 2. So uh, sine of pi over 2 is 1, so 1 cubed is also 1. I get 1 minus one-third. That gives me 2 thirds, and then pi over 2 from the theta portion here. Multiply that out. I want to put the positive part first, so I get 9 pi over 2 minus 6. That is the portion of that cutout, which is above this half disk. Now, let's talk about this carefully. Why did we only use the half disk? Why not use the full disk with bounds going from 0 to pi? Shouldn't that give me the same answer? Well, again, just as good practice, using the portion that's in the first quadrant ensures that x and y are both positive. That is, sine theta and cosine theta are both positive. If I use the full disk, and remember with these circles that are offset from the origin in polar coordinates, you traverse the entire circle as you go from 0 to pi. And as I go from 0 to pi, well, sine of theta is positive, but cosine of theta is positive in the first quadrant, but it's negative in the second quadrant. So cosine of theta changes sine. Why would that matter? Well, Let's think about this. I said that the uh, antiderivative that we evaluated here was u to the power of 3 halves evaluated from 9 to 9 cosine squared theta. And we worked it out this way. We said that the uh, square root of uh, cosine theta, uh, cosine squared theta would be cosine theta, then cube it, you get cosine cubed theta. And it worked out to be 9 pi over 2 minus 6. But really, cosine squared raised to the 3 halves power is radical cosine squared cubed. Okay, so far so good. But radical of cosine squared, unless I know that cosine squared theta is always positive, I really have to take the absolute value of cosine theta and then cube it, because radical of x squared is the absolute value of x. Only when I know x is positive can I remove the absolute value signs. So if I were to look at uh, the value of the absolute value of cosine 
theta cubed. Well, in the first quadrant, it is just cosine cubed theta. So what I wrote here is correct because I know I'm in the first quadrant. My bounds go from 0 to pi over 2. However, if I'm in the second quadrant, it's going to be minus cosine cubed theta. So if I had bounds from 0 to pi, I would really have to break this up into two integrals, or at least break up the evaluation here into two parts. I'd have to look at the uh, integral from 0 to pi over 2. There I have the positive cosine cubed theta minus 1 d theta, exactly what I had uh, up here after the evaluation. Uh, but then for the second quadrant, so going from pi over 2 to pi, cosine changes sign. So now this has to be negative cosine cubed theta minus 1. So I have a different uh, integral to evaluate here. So I already worked this out before. That's how we got the 2 thirds minus pi over 2. Uh, but here I can find the antiderivative in the same way. I go ahead and break this out as negative. Uh, so I bring this negative sign out here in front to make that a minus. Rewrite cosine cubed theta as cosine theta times cosine squared theta. And replace cosine squared theta by 1 minus sine squared theta. So it's the same type of work we did before. Take that antiderivative. Now evaluate it between pi over 2 and pi, with this minus sign out in front. And go ahead and collect the like terms, multiply out by the negative 9, and you wind up with 9 pi minus 12. So that's when the bounds go from 0 to pi. And sure enough, that is twice what I had when the bounds went from 0 to pi over 2. All right, so we haven't actually finished our example, so let's go back. We found out that the portion above this half disk the, that was cut out, the volume that was cut out, had 9 pi over 2 minus 6 units in it. So the whole cutout then is 4 times that, or 18 pi minus 24. And so to find the volume remaining, I'll take the volume of a sphere, 4 thirds pi r cubed. I have a mistake here. Pi r cubed. Good. So that would be, uh, let's see here, 27 divided by 3 is 9. 9 times 4 is 36. 36 pi minus 18 pi will give me my 18. Not minus 18, 18. Then minus and minus 24 is plus 24. So 18 pi plus 24 is the volume remaining.